Remember last year I got roasted on my 50th birthday, and uh, Brother Warren Johnson said that, and it made me just think, Brother Colson's saying he hasn't changed in 40 years. Let me just tell you, Brother Colson is so old, when he was born, the Dead Sea wasn't even sick, okay? I'm just telling you that much right now. And, uh, I just did. He could preach good on creation because he was there, brother. I'm telling you that much right now. But, uh, oh, what a man of God Brother Colston is. I can't go anywhere in the Calumet region without finding somebody that he has preached a funeral for, baptized, loved someone to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love him. So thankful for the ministry that he and Mrs. Colston have. I was sitting at a table this week with a pastor up in... Um, Maryland, and he just said, tell me about the Colstons, and it was just wonderful to be able to speak about them and, and to talk about how, how much they mean to our church family. We love them and appreciate them very, very much. Well, this is our last subject uh, we'll talk about in the book of James for a while, and some of you said, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm glad there's other books of the Bible. Move on, Pastor. It's an unusual experiment. You have been our guinea pigs this year. I my, I've only pastored for 18 years, but I've never just taken a summer and just preached through one book, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and midweek service. But uh, that is what I think the Lord led us to do, because James is, James's theme is maturity, and mature Christians are a blessing. But maturity is something we must grow into. We must show maturity and grow in maturity. And James preaches to the, the Jewish people, primarily scattered abroad throughout all of the world through a persecution that had come. And no doubt he's getting letters of complaint and crying and upset about how can we do this, how can we keep going. And he tells them, listen, you got to mature. You got to grow up. You got to be strong. And he goes through the book of James and gives several things that make people mature or show if people are mature. Number one, trials or suffering. When people are mature, when trials come, they thank God for them, they pray for wisdom in the middle of them, and they persevere through them. I was talking to Brother Larry Owens today, our missionary to Argentina, and uh, he buried his wife um, two weeks ago. 45 days she got sick, and then 45 days later, she, he said, boy, he told me at the, at the lunch table today, he said, Pastor, I would have never dreamed at the beginning of the year that uh, the love of my life would be gone. I, I wondered, I wanted her to stay. I didn't want her to go. And uh, just, she wasn't feeling well, found that she had cancer, it had gone all over her body, brought her back to the States, nothing they could do there, went to Tijuana, we tried to get alternative treatment, came back to central Illinois, in a few days she was with Jesus. So quickly that, that took place. And you know, he said, now give me advice on what to do from here. I said, boy, you can't go out of it. You're going to have to go through it. But we can do it if we endure difficult times. God has a crown of life for those who love him. And I know Brother Owens is going to love the Lord, but he's so hollow right now. You pray for him. I know many of our men have gone through that. Our ladies have gone through that. But when trials come, they show maturity, and he's a mature Christian. And they grow us in maturity when we thank God for them, we ask for wisdom in the middle of them, and we endure through them. It's just the way there's no... God is a God not of transition. Most of us, when we have a problem, we want out yesterday. God is a God who wants us to transformation in the middle of it. He wants to change us, and he's a transformational God. We also grow in wisdom when, based upon our approach to the scriptures. God's given us the Bible, first of all, to help us get saved. We're beget by the word of truth. We're, we get into God's family by the word of truth. Number two, it's there to help us grow in grace after we're saved. And it's a mirror. But a mirror will not get you dressed in the morning and just tell you what to do to get yourself dressed. And uh, the Word of God is not going to change you, but when you look into the mirror, the perfect law of liberty, and then you do what it tells you to do, you're going to find maturity will be shown and grown. And it, you know, it'll reveal itself in three ways, James said. Number one, it'll reveal in, in how I talk, in my bridled speech. Number two, my benevolent spirit, how I give. And number three, my blameless separation. I'll not be spotted by this world. The Word of God inside of me it changes me and, and, and helps me. By the way, out of the abundance of the, the mouth speak. If you know how to bridle your mouth, bridle your heart. 
You know how to bridle your heart? Love, obey, meditate on the scriptures. Our bridal speech, our benevolent spirit, and our blameless separation. We show obedience and we show maturity by the way we treat other people. The Bible says if I show respect to persons, I've sinned. But he said when the Lord of glory, when I put God in his rightful place, and I'll learn rich, poor, meet together, the Lord's the making them all, I'm not going to exercise prejudice and bias. And, and, and mature Christians love everybody. And love is not feeling right about someone. It's just making a decision to treat someone right. You don't have to every every. You don't have to feel like you love everybody, but you need to treat everybody right. And that is the admonition of James chapter two. And then tells us, if you uh, if you have faith, work it out. Show your faith by your works. And uh, every every time you come to First Baptist Church, I hope the Spirit of God provokes you to do something more for God. We all ought to have that. You'll be thankful. You sometimes, and I've had, I remember one time a banker came to our church for a while and he finally set an appointment with me. He says, Pastor, I can't stay in your church. You make it sound like I need to do something every week for the Lord. He said, he said I mean, you're always like, look, I just want to come hear the word. This is what he told me. He said, especially on Sunday morning. But you're bringing up missionaries and provoking us to do this and want to do that. I just want to come hear the word, man. And the truth of the matter is, that's not why God made you. <laughs> he made you to hear the word so it stimulate your heart to get out and do something for him. So you can do, well done, thou good and faithful sitter. No. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And maturity is shown by doing, by serving by finding something to do in the work of the Lord. And what you cannot do with energy, you should do with urgency. You ought to find out something you can do. And some of us, we may all we can do is get on our knees and pray before the Lord. We may not be able to do everything that we used to be able to do. I was praying with Brother Colston, and he said, you know, he prayed and talked to the Lord. He said, you know, Lord, I remember many years being able to participate in BBS. He said, I can't do that any longer. But I'm going to pray that you'll work in the lives of these young people. What he cannot do with energy anymore, you have to do with urgency and begin to earnestly pray. But we have to do something for the Lord. Then we show maturity by our speech, chapter 3. We show maturity by taking on a spiritual wisdom that is first pure and then peaceable and, and easy to be entreated, full of good works, full of mercy, without hypocrisy, without partiality. And it's, it's righteousness sown in peace of them that make peace. Wisdom is from above is a peaceful endeavor. And it creates peace. Many of us, we walk in a room, we create drama. Others of us, we calm a troubled storm. And a lot of that depends upon what kind of wisdom you're practicing. Is it earthly wisdom, sensual wisdom, devilish wisdom? Or is it wisdom that's from above? God will put a peace on a person who practices biblical wisdom. In chapter 4, he tells us how to overcome the worldly wisdom, the sensual wisdom, and the devilish wisdom, and that is with submission. Submitting to God. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. He goes on, draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Give seven steps on what we can do to overcome uh, the, the, the tendencies within us to yield to the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then in chapter 4, he says, we show wisdom, we grow in wisdom by our awareness of the brevity of life. Life is short. My grandmother would say, John, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. He said, life is short. It goes quickly. I had a man the other day, he told me, and I remember years ago watching we had these little kids all around us, and Linda was taking care of our children. They're just little stair-step little guys, three boys, and then Lydia, and then, then four more boys, and little Lacey. But, boy, just a few days. I've had people say, you know, enjoy these times. Enjoy these times. In just a few years, boy, you're going to see they're going to go so quickly. And I was sitting at the supper table the other day, and we only had seven people at our table. It was, it was terrible. Looking over just five of them, and another one's getting ready to move, and we, boy, we get, are you getting ready to, to, you can see transition coming. And then one of the boys said, hey, Dad, in two years, in three years, you're only going to have two here. I was like, shut up. <laughs> you're killing me. 
When you're young, when there's young, those, but the, the, the days can be long, but the years are short. But that's true for everybody. Whether you have one child, no children, whether you're single or married, whether you're a, you're a senior adult or a teenager, boy, life is going quickly. And the Bible tells us, don't, don't get too anxious to try to make money. I'm going to go this city and that city, and we'll, we'll buy and sell, and we'll get gain, and make life all about profit. Know that your life is just a vapor. You have a small time, you've got to make good decisions with what you do. Because him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you know you can do something good with your time and you don't do it, do something good with your money and you don't do it, it's sin. We don't use our time wisely. Then in chapter 5, he says, maturity is going to be shown in how I look at substance and money and possessions. And he gives a harsh rebuke to the, to the wealthy. And that's everybody in this room. He said, you're going to weep and howl. For the problems are going to come to you in just a few days when you stand before God, you're going to wish that you had looked at savings differently. He said, man, your riches are corrupted. Your clothes are moth-eaten. You've got so many clothes in your closet, the moth is eating me. They don't, the closet, uh, moths don't eat moving people. <laughs> when you're on your, your clothes are on you, they don't, eat, they don't have to worry about the moths. They're not going to follow you around. But you stick them in your closet too long, and you don't, you don't filter through some of those things, give them away. Boy, all of us have to fight materialism. And the enemy of materialism, one of your antidotes to materialism is learning to give. Learning to share with what God's given you. See, your gold and silver, you've kept it so long, it's cankered. And it'll be an indictment against you in the latter days when you could have given. He said the wealthy, oftentimes you mistreat people. You live for pleasure and you're wanting. He said, you you're, you're also subdue others because of your wealth. You think you're, you're the boss. And because you've got money, you can hurt other people and subdue other people. And pride can come because of that. And he hits them hard, and then he goes on to the steadfast. He tells us, be patient. Be patient through difficult times. We show maturity by being steadfast. One of the strengths of this church is because many people have done what they've done for decades. Many of us have heard Brother, Brother Evans say this that um, I, uh, success is not measured in years, it's measured in decades. One of the most beautiful things about First Baptist Church is people that are still serving Jesus, not just a few weeks after they got saved, not just a few months, not just a few years, but for decades, continuing to do the right thing. And every one of us in here, and you'll have people come like Brother, Brother um, Tebow did tonight, and they'll say, thank you. Oh, I've been coming here for 40 years, and it's so refreshing to see people who've been faithful all those years. By the way, the more people, the, the more people come by here, they're going to keep saying that because there's, a, there's value and stability. There's value and steadfastness, and it shows maturity when someone stays. You know, how does someone stay married 67 years and someone gets married and, and stays together for six years? You know, they hit some of the same bumps, some of the same troubles, some of the difficulties. You think about the Noah Kalsies. They had some financial battles in 67 years of being married. They had some disagreements, some family fallout. They had some times where it was very difficult. You know what they did? They just kept on going. Just kept loving a little bit more. The steadfastness is a beautiful thing. And then he says supplication or, or prayer. We talked about that this morning. Let's go back if we can and look at it. just a couple things. And I, as I shared with you this morning, look at verse 13. Is any among you be afflicted? Let him pray. Any among you, any Mary, let him sing psalms, spiritual songs. If any of you sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of save, faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. If he committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one to another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Real quickly, just by recap, there's three things you need to understand here. Number one, you have options. When you're afflicted, when you're going through a difficult time, God says your first option that you can exercise is prayer. You having a spat with your wife? Pray. You have, a, you have a problem with your child? Pray. You got to go talk to your son, your daughter about a problem they're going through? Pray. You look at your checkbook and you don't have enough money to make the ends meet? You're afflicted. What do you do? Let him that is afflicted, let him pray. The option God gave us when we need help, when we're in trouble, is to pray. That's your first priority. Your first option God gives you. Number two, if you're happy, you're merry, things are going good, sing. Sing a praise to the Lord. That's what the psalms are. Sing a praise song to the Lord. 
Say, Pastor, I can't carry a, a tune in a bucket with a handle on it. Sing anyway. God loveth it. He loveth it. He loves the a joy. Make a joyful sound to the Lord. Sing psalms. And then he says, if you're sick, call for the elders. Have faith enough to ask the leaders of the church to come. Get a hold of your Sunday school teacher. Get a hold of our office. Find someone, and they'll get more than one person to come and, and then pray over you. Anoint you with oil as a sign or a symbol of God's help is needed for this person. And they'll do it in the name of the Lord. Then God says the obligation that we need in order to have effective prayer is righteousness. The, the, fervent, the effective virtual, a fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The obligation for prayer that is answered is going to be righteousness. Probably the number one reason why prayers is, is it goes heavily upon the righteousness of the person. Now, you can pray when you're not right with God. But the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's just what the Bible says, friend. I was talking to our boys last night. I was asking them to look up some verses and Judson and, and uh, Coleman were helping me as I was sitting and they were looking at verses and I was thinking, look this verse up, look this verse. And we read that. And we talked about that. I said, you know, whenever, boys, whenever you guys are doing what I ask you to do and you're a blessing to be with and you're obeying your mom, you're not talking back and you're not selfish and you're doing what you're supposed to do, when you ask me something, I am so ready to do it. Even if I can't do it, I want to do it. Even if it's not even best for you, I still want to do it. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a right fellowship going on there. And the same is true with our Heavenly Father. He said, it's, the, it's the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous prayer that avails much. There's two ways to be right. Number one, with God. Verse 15 talks about, he goes, in the prayer of faith shall save the sick. If you've committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. And then he said, confess your faults. Faults, I think, is talking about an, or a break in an earthly relationship. Somebody's not right here. And when you come to give a gift in Matthew 18 and other, Matthew 10, I think, maybe 18, he said, if you come to give a gift and then you think, I got a problem with somebody, what does God want you to do? Leave your gift to the altar and go get it right. And when we have a problem, he said, confess it, agree, you got a problem, pray for that person that you can be healed. And then, of course, the fervency, uh, affection, prayer availeth much. Then I want you to look real quickly at the opportunity. Look at the next verse, if you would, please. Verse 17, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. What do you think that means, subject to like passions like we are? What would, if a third grader asked you to define that, what would you say? Someone talk to me real quickly. Yeah, what's that? Same temptation. Yeah, same temptation. He's made of flesh and blood. He's got the same problems we do. He's, he's, a, he's a human being. Who was Elijah? Yes, he was used of the Lord, but he was a guy that had the same temptation, same passions, same potential for materialism, same potential for sin as I have, same human being, and yet he prayed fervently that it not rain. Look if you would please at verse number 17. He prayed fervently that it not rain, and it, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Verse 18, read it with me. And he prayed... And the heaven and the earth. You can see this in 1 Kings chapter 17. It's the first time that Elijah comes on the pages of our Bible. Chapter 18, there is the Mount Carmel experience. He walks in in 17 and tells Ahab, it's not going to rain till I say so. And it looks like the Bible's teaching. He prayed, Lord, don't let it rain until it's time. Then... God said, we well, go by the brook Cherith, sit there. He stayed there, twiddled his thumbs, and got breakfast and dinner from the ravens for a long time. The brook dried up, and I'm sure he's saying, okay, is this what prophets do? Just sit around and twiddle their thumbs and wait? So what's my next assignment? Now go and sit, sit with a widow and, and uh, take care of this widow or go with this widow. I'm like, really? By the way, it teaches me that usually God hides someone before they use them. You can see numbers of times in that in the Bible. David. He was anointed king. What did he do after he got anointed king? He went back and watched sheep. See, Moses, the great leader, 40 years on the backside of the desert. Jesus, 18 years of his life from the time he was 12 till he was 30, 18 years. You know how much you'll know about him in 18 years? He obeyed his, his mom and dad. <laughs> and he worked in a carpenter shop in a city called Nazareth, the other side of the tracks. 
just quiet, in hiding. All through the Bible, you see even, even uh, uh, Paul, before God used Paul, he had three years in Arabia, kind of in quiet, quietness. You know, oftentimes there are no doubt people under the sound of my voice right now, you're in that time. God has something for you, and you don't know what it is, and I don't know what it is. You could ask me. I couldn't tell you, and, and uh, you could suggest to me, and maybe it would be right. I don't know. But you're right now in that, in that silence. You're in that hiding. You, you really, you're like wondering what's going on. And some of you are sitting by the brook chair, twiddling your thumbs and thinking, is this why I'm still living? Will I be doing this forever? Well, I'm just tell you something. If you're sitting in a zone of silence, know that God is watching, he's waiting, and he's working. And God's got his eye on the, th on the thermometer and his hand on the thermostat. He knows what's going on in your life. Your times are in his hand. But God used Elijah. A few days later, he wasn't, he wasn't sitting by the brook. He wasn't in the backyard of, the, of, of, uh, of that widow woman. He was on Mount Carmel calling down fire from heaven. And then... He begins to pray about, about, a, uh, about rain. They need rain. It's been three and a half years. I can't imagine the drought that they have. And yet he says, he said, listen, now I'm going to pray. The Bible says he got on his hands and knees, and he got as low as you can go. He put his head right between his knees. Without looking up, he, he prayed that there would be fire, there would be a, a rain. He told his servant, go, go look, is there a... Is there a is there a cloud in the sky? The guy went and looked and said, no, no, sir, <laughs> no cloud in the sky. And he went multiple times. And finally, the guy came back, and I'm sure he thought, man, why does he keep asking me this? But he's got his hand on his face, his, hand, his head down as low as it can go, between his knees, crying out to God that he would bring rain. And finally, the man said, you know what? There is a cloud. It's like a man's hand. And sure enough, rain began to come. You know what the Bible tells us? Every one of us have opportunities to go to God on his behalf and see God work. And you can do that. You don't have to be a man. You can be a lady. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be old. You don't have to be young. Anybody can go to God in prayer. It's something everybody can do. A while ago when I encouraged the church to pray, every one of us had a chance to talk to God. Only a few people will talk behind this pulpit. I'll tell you a quick story. I, was, I came here for a pastor school, and I sat in the back over here, and I was just like, wow, this is a big place. And I thought, good night. And I sat back there, maybe about third row from the back, and I, it just seemed like it was so far from there to where this was, and I was so happy at all God that was doing it, First Baptist of Hammond. But I was sitting back there with a couple men, several men from our church in Long Beach, and I remember thinking to myself, Boy, am I glad Brother Scott doesn't know who I am. Because if he asked me to come up here and pray or something and asked me to come up there, I'd just die right here, you know. Now I have tortured other people doing the same things that I've been the pastor here. I just thought, man, there's just no way. I, I, wouldn't, be able to, I wouldn't be able to focus if I, if, I, if I had to get up there. I hope that never happens. I, hope, I just kind of, if you Lord look over me, I just start hiding underneath the seat over there. I remember when I became your pastor, I'm just coming out here and just seeing... This thing, I thought, oh, well, Lord, please have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon these people. <laughs> I told you, I, before I ever was a pastor, I preached seven times. Before I was ever a pastor in the year 2000. And uh, three of the times were at my grandmother's church. He was messing up my vacation. Every time I would show up at my grandmother's house, the pastor would call within two hours and say, oh, John, you're in town. Can you preach on Sunday night? Can you preach on Wednesday night? And I said, like, Grandmother, you're killing me. I'm, you're ruining my whole vacation. Three times I, I, of those seven times when I preached, I got sick and threw up, uh, just stressed out about preaching. The other four times, I think the audience got sick and threw up. <laughs> so it's a, it was rough. It was a rough experience for me and for the people that had to listen to me. But, you know, we have an opportunity, just like Elias. He was a man subject like pastor, but he just prayed. You know, everybody can pray. You don't know what to do, you can pray. But make it a priority. Make it your first option. Don't say, well, I'm going to work and do all this stuff, and then I'm going to pray. Pray and then work. Pray to ask God to help you be a prayer warrior. Be right before God and pray. James tells us what to do. And I want you to look at the last two verses. This is it. Let's look at it if we can, please. 
We see supplication. Now we see soul winning and salvaging other people. Look at verse number 19. Maturity is shown and it's grown, brethren. If any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You know, the last thing that mature Christians show and grow in maturity is their desire to win the lost and salvage the saved. Whenever we grow in maturity, we will have a burden for souls. Now, I've had burdens for souls for, from before, and sometimes it wanes sometimes because I don't like to be rejected. I remember walking away. I gave numbers of tracts out last week, tried to get engaged in several conversations about the gospel. But I remember one particular thing, and I, and I, I was too far away to do anything about it, but I thought to myself, Lord, I'm so sorry. I did not. I talked to that lady about several things. I did not give her a gospel tract. I didn't speak about you. But you know, as I grow in my Christian life and as I mature, I will get a concern for the lost. And I will want to find a brother or sister who has fallen or messed up or is an heir doctrinally, and I'll try to sway them back. And in doing so, I not only can save a soul from death, but I can cover a multitude of sins. You know, if I don't know if you've thought about this. I'm sure you have. But could you imagine I brought this to your attention before? Could you imagine just knowing what happened with 78,000 people in Hammond, Indiana last night in every home in our city? With every little child. Imagine maybe a little girl going to bed at night, scared already, and then the door opens and all kinds of wickedness, drunkenness, drugs immorality, perversion. Just in one city in our, on our, in, our, in our state, if we knew what happened in one town on a Saturday night, and God lets us know every single abode, every hotel room, every, every situation, every little child, every teenager, every drunken man that comes in and slaps and beats his wife or kids, if we just knew what happened in one city, of the world. We'd probably all go to the funny farm. We wouldn't be able to contain such misery and sadness. But you know, we have a God in heaven, and among many other things, he's omniscient. He knows everything, what happened in the entire world. In Thailand, in Cambodia, in Pakistan, in India, in China, in Hammond, in Calumet City, in Chicago, in Las Vegas, in New York, in Buenos Aires, in Sao Paulo, any, everywhere in the world. He knows exactly what happened last night. And the only thing that can stop that and retard the vile, wicked things that happen is the gospel. See, why are we sending missionaries everywhere? Because the gospel can cover a multitude of sins. It can keep people from dying and going to hell. It can keep the lost. It can help children have a godly dad. Listen to a man the other day preach. And he said, you know, my dad was a drunk for 25 years. My precious mom went through all kinds of things. But you know what could have stopped that 25 years ago? Is the gospel. What could have covered a multitude of sins? The gospel. As we grow in maturity, we ought to get caring about the gospel. We ought to keep gospel tracts. We ought to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to pray for the lost. I encourage you to take a piece of paper, maybe after church tonight, and put on one side, on, just draw a line down the middle. On the left side, put salvation. On the right side, put salvage. And why don't you start putting people's names that need to be saved on that left side and begin to earnestly pray for them. And on the right side, people that are, they're, as far as you know, they're Christians, but they're just away from Jesus. They're in an error of their ways. They're going down a wrong path in a, in a, in a breakneck pace. And you start praying. You say, you know, I'm going to put those names down. I'm going to pray for them. 
And then, and then not only witness to them and not only work on them, but, but pray for others to come back to the Lord. That's interesting to me that as James ends this book of the Bible with all the things we've studied, he leaves the last two verses. It seems like the pinnacle of maturity will be shown in someone's willingness to win the lost and salvage someone who's going wrong. Are you a mature Christian? Am I mature enough to do something about it? I'll tell you where it'll start. I think it's interesting. Right before salvation and soul winning and salvaging here is prayer. As he concludes the book, he says, you know what? I think I'm going to leave the best two for last. Because if you pray, people will get saved. If you care about the wayward, you'll win the wayward. If you pray for them, you'll change it. I think about my neighbors and had the joy last two months ago to lead a neighbor to the Lord. And it was a, it was a beautiful testimony. But five years, hundreds and hundreds of times I've prayed for them. And when I see them, I'm not thinking about their petunias. I don't think about their lilies. I don't think about their yard, the newest car they got. I think about, are they saved? Is this the time I should talk to them? I remember going around my circle on a Saturday afternoon thinking, you know what, I can, I'm ready to go home, I'm tired, but let me go see if my neighbors are home. I remember knocking on the door, going through there. I said, get in here, John, come on in here, sit down at our dining room table. And I went through the gospel. They let me go through the gospel, and he said, you know, John, I don't know when I would ever really listen to you. He said, but I've been in the emergency room five times out of the last seven days. I've had a lot of time to think about where I'm going to spend eternity. I'm ready to get saved. And he accepted the Lord. But you know, that wasn't birth because John Wilkerson is anything. That's birth, I think, through prayer. And a burden. Passion and vision are birthed in prayer. And I think James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, leaves the last two burdens, the last two things that build maturity is prayer and a personal walk with God that will produce souls and salvage for those who are away from the Lord. How many can think of someone who needs to be saved? We oftentimes ask you that. How many know someone that you're asking God to save? You know, I ask you that. I don't ask you that because I would not go around and say, who are you talking about? But I want everyone to think about someone who's not saved. Maybe write their name down. How many know someone who you believe they're saved or just away from the Lord? And they need to come back to Jesus. How many think of someone like that? Well, I hope you start praying for them. Then ask God to give you the maturity to be there when you need to be there to help them get back to the Lord Jesus Christ or get to him for salvation. Let's stand together, can we please? I do personally, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to thank you for your patience this summer as I went through the book of James with us together. I know I have reviewed it every time, and some of you may say, Pastor, why do you keep doing that? I think repetition is the key to learning. But I pray that tonight we talk about the last two, prayer, supplication, and soul winning and salvaging. If God's dealt in your heart tonight, let's don't even let the music start. But the music can start whenever you're ready there, Debbie. Let's respond to the Lord and let's, let's make this altar a prayer place for us right now while the instruments play, while our trio gets ready to sing. Let's take our time and let's talk.